Jennifer Ash. Uh, she is a UI designer at Bungie. Yep. Uh. <laughs> So, um, as, uh, as it was announced, I'm a UI UX designer at Bungie. I've been working in that position since September. Prior to that, I joined Bungie in 2012 um, as a user researcher and worked in that role for three years. I covered uh, many of the games and expansions, so I, I worked on Destiny while it was still in pre-production. And so, uh, some of the th roles that I had, I had different focus areas for each uh, release. So for the launch of it, I was focused on the art, combatants, uh, the bungee net, the web and mobile team, and the social aspects of the game. And then for the expansions, the Dark Below and House of Wolves, I was the UR project lead. And then for the Taken King, um, I was working with the art teams, the user interface team, the PVP, and the live team, as well as the web and mobile team still to focus on what sort of things could we improve and what kind of studies we could do. So what I wanted to cover today is kind of show some of the lessons I learned about maybe testing some areas that typically isn't covered in user research and maybe not about the specific numbers or how you can run algorithms, but instead, how can you explore different areas of the game and um, get the feedback to the designers that they need. One thing I'd like to note is that Destiny is a live game. It's ever evolving. A lot of the examples you'll see will have probably changed today. So just take that into consideration um, as you hear some of the things that we looked at early on in the game. So this is kind of the area, the blue circle uh, square is kind of where we're um, going to be focused today. So one of the things we had an advantage of with having a new IP is exploring things before we had gameplay necessarily. So some of these areas were environments and combatants and characters. And what I mean by that is we had a lot of concept art and we also had a lot of in-world activities, but at that point there may be not navigation marks or gameplay or like enemies placed right. So how could we evaluate this while it's still in this early state? So we ran a number of studies looking at the navigation, the gameplay um, communication aspects and the visual cues for the player. A lot of these studies were largely uh, survey driven, so we'd put the players into a playtest lab. We have about 18 seats in our playtest lab, and we'd have them run through the environments. And when they ran through the environments, we typically put them on deathless as well as um, all powerful, because we didn't want them getting caught up in how difficult a space was, because we weren't looking at balance. We were only looking at how players thought about as they w walked through the space, and we made sure up front that that was clear. So some of the things that we found really useful early on was asking questions like, what is this space used for? Um, which gave us context as to what the players assumed the destination was about and maybe how it had evolved. Um, and that's related to the combatants that they were interacting with. And also early on, players didn't know where this was based. So we asked them what planet the, the environment was located on. That gave us good cues if we were hitting the right uh, communication as to where it was placed within the universe or if it was completely uh, new to them, like Venus may not be exactly how people would expect it to be, so this was a great way for us to determine what cues we would want to use and which things we wanted to focus on. Um, we also focused on how bright and muted the colors were because it was important to the artists and also bare and cluttered the spaces were as well as if they were human or alien made which plays into the lore of the game in terms of understanding the space again, like what is it used for and how is it interacting with the game. The other thing that was important early on was lost in confusion because we wanted to know if players were going to get lost in spaces. Even though we'd have waypoints later on to work with the gameplay, we really wanted to make sure that players could navigate the space as it was with the past that the artist provided as well as understanding where there were doorways and other things like tunnels that they could interact with. So there were a number of studies that we could provide early feedback to the environment artists and the designers in terms of how the spaces were being used. So the lesson I learned from that was that a lot of times early on, concept art can actually aid in discovery of early uh, usability issues with uh, players. Other, uh, we evolved that into other areas. So from environment studies, we also early on, before there was difficulty, we looked at how combatants and the environments interacted with each other. So there were a lot of different aspects about the combatants that they had to fit into the space. It made sense why they were in the space. Like you wouldn't expect them to totally stand out. Otherwise, how are they surviving? Um, so we wanted to look at not only what abilities the combatants had, but also how visibly 
uh, different they were from their environments. As you can see in these pictures, it's pretty difficult to actually determine where some of the combatants were early on. In terms of some of the cabal within the Mars tunnels, they blended pretty well, um, really well. And then also for like the shanks on the moon, they tended to blend very well for the players. So even though they were flying combatants, it made them even more difficult by the fact that they, you couldn't really see them in some spaces. So in that, we were able to inform the artists of having some way to contrast or communicate uh, the visual clarity of the combatants early on in the game instead of trying to find out later that participants were finding them frustrating and difficult, not necessarily because of how difficult they were, but instead because of how difficult they were to actually see in the game and interact with. We, uh, how we tested this was since we are still doing survey-driven studies, we would set it up such that at the end we would show them a picture like this and have them actually, we'd give them the warning, you have five seconds to look at this image, we want to know how many combatants are in that space. And so we would have them, we'd put up the image for five seconds, pull it back down and then they'd get a screen that said, how many did you see? And then based upon what we heard back in terms of how accurate those numbers were over the participants, as well as asking defining questions, but using them as more of an identifier as to which ones they saw, were really good at helping us identify early on, perhaps was it just our thoughts that we think it's hard to see, or are our participants also having the same difficulty? So this is some way we could give um, feedback to the larger creation and design of Destiny. So the lesson I learned from that was that uh, a lot of times you can experiment and evolve the studies that you're working with to find out what designs fit the content that you're exploring at the time. So one of the things that we found out is that Destiny is very social. And uh, you may have seen this video before. It's pretty popular in the studio, actually, um, as well as here. I'm going to leave it running in the background so you can kind of get an idea about what I'm explaining. So as you can see, we were running a lot of these studies that were play tests and other things, but we also found that there was a lot of emergent social behavior happening. And one of the things that happened was that players would see each other and they'd be like, hmm, is that another NPC or is that a player? I don't know. I'm going to assume that most of the games I play have NPCs, so it's probably no one. But in some of the studies, we'd find people be like, hey, that, that guy's sitting on a, on a cliff. What is he doing? And he, like, so he's coming up to him. He's going to sit down and they're going to enjoy a moment in the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> or on the edge. And you see them, they're like, oh my gosh, it's another person. Like, it's great to see their realization that they're interacting with someone. And for this, they knew they were in the lab, so that, that kind of narrowed it down. Yeah. <laughs> and then they start looking at each other, and the smile on their faces was the best moment ever, just to see them be like, yeah, this is cool, like a shared moment. And then they run on their way, right? So the thing that we had difficulty with is like we could see these emergent times, but the only reason we caught this was because we were watching at the time, like you could see us walking back and forth in the background. And we caught this moment and we took a timestamp. But normally, how else do you test this? And we had a team dedicated to like how do we make these moments in the game? And we, know, we knew that we were kind of missing some of the understanding about how players would react to this. So it took uh, coordination with the, the teams and the development team in large to figure out how to solve this. What we ended up doing, so we had pretty high security, we still have high security, in the lab um, with the firewalls about networking with the dev team as well as in the playtest lab. So the playtest lab's pretty well locked down. We had to punch a hole in the firewall, get permission to do that, and then connect it with upstairs. We worked with the developers to actually be online at the same time as our playtest, so they stayed late one night, and we had a chat up that said, okay, so what we're dealing with right now is that we have a difficulty in getting everyone into the same environment at the same time. Because with 18 people, the networking just wasn't matching people well. So we need to get more people in. So we'd launch someone in, a player would launch in, and we'd be like, go! And they would launch themselves in. And we could see that like, they got matched with two or three other people. The developers understood that what they were supposed to do is just run around like you were playing. Like run around, run to a mission, go do something. If you see him, like, would you wave to him? Go ahead and wave to him. So we would get this results back in terms of like, when players interact with other people, this is how they react. And designers were actively involved, so they were already watching and taking in the, uh, the information. And we could understand, like, are they missing out on knowing that it's another player? What do they do? Do they, do they follow them, or do they just kind of like ignore them and think it's weird? So we got a lot of experiential information from this uh, one play test that we did to try and understand better how people were playing with each other and what sort of things we could leverage better. And honestly, having the developers involved helped a lot in terms of understanding how they were building their game out to be a better experience um, for that. So it was kind of one of those rare occasions that we were able to experiment with our study design to 
get a little bit more information that maybe wasn't data driven necessarily. So the one thing from that was that we had to be flexible in terms of how we were testing this and what we expected from the results. So the designers and the user researchers up front knew that we weren't going to come out with any data to act on, but it was more just understanding what was happening within the game itself and how people were reacting to these new mechanics. The other thing I want to touch on is building trust with designers you work with. So a lot of it um, is working with players, having them uh, watch your studies, but the other half part of it is actually building the trust to receive feedback and give feedback and get designers on board. So this is from, this example is actually from House of Wolves. Um, we were working with designers. We had a small team working on it, so we had fast iteration uh, times. Our builds were pretty stable and we could get changes in. One of the, we tested all the different uh, ending combatment, combatants for Prison of Elders, but there was one that we were having particular difficulty with in the lab. Um, participants were having difficulty with understanding how the mechanics worked for it. The designers were like, oh yeah, we're watching it, we understand, but we think we'll get that we think that they will get it if they actually play it in real life. Like, don't worry, they'll work it out. I was like, okay, well, I have concerns about how this is happening. Do you mind coming down and sitting in the lab with me when we run through this? If they have problems, you're there to answer questions. Otherwise, I'm uncomfortable with having them struggle this much and just get failure cases in terms of how long they're trying to solve this. Like, All right, cool, I'll come down. So they sat behind this group of testers. And this was after they, the testers had already played through one. So we could see that they were talented. It wasn't that that was the issue. And the designer was like, OK, do you mind if I debrief with them? I was like, sure, go ahead. So he took them outside and debriefed with them on the strategy of it. So that way, they could attempt it again with knowing how they were supposed to attempt it. So they came back in, they tried, and they still failed. And the designer, this really locked into the fact that he needed to change something. So he went back up to his desk and changed it. Like That was the best win for me in terms of getting them to actually understand, see what it is, but working with them on understanding that I'm not just telling them, no, your design's wrong, like you need to change it, but like, no, watch them struggle, watch them see what they're uh, working with and help me help you get, make this encounter better. But that was only possible because I had built that trust over the time with giving them results. So the, other, so the lesson from that, was get designers to watch and get them involved. And by how to do that, make sure that things are accessible and also comfortable for the designers. So we invite them to sit in our theater with us when we do usability studies. We invite them to watch from their desk and message us if they have any questions. We send them reminders as well as calendar invites for when we run studies so they're actively aware of what's happening. And we also make sure that we use results in our, we, we, we make sure to use videos in our results so that way they can quickly see like here's our feedback but here's where it's happening in the play test. So they can get context as to what they're receiving in, in a written form. Um, and also just make it worth their time, like that's including it in the results, but make sure that they don't have to scrub through videos in order to find out what's important to them. Point them at where they should look to understand, um, because you probably have a better idea as a researcher what happened in the lab and what happened in the study to direct their attention. So one of the other things we tested, also kind of uh, social related, was fire teams. Um, it tested really well in subjective feedback. Um, people said that they were super interested in them, that they found them fun and interesting, but there were some UX challenges that we had to address. In the, in the results we had from our surveys, we received this graph, which to a user researcher is a giant warning sign. Like, what is going on here? How is it possible that, that half of the participants thought it was very easy to determine where your teammates were, but the other half had no idea? So we went to the data. For one of the, uh, we went to the player pathing in specific to see what was happening. So in this, in this uh, mapping of the environment, you can see that all the players played together nicely. They went through um, the activity fairly well together. We were like, okay. So that's probably the results of the people that thought it was very easy. We pulled up some other data. And this is just one example of a map to indicate. And we saw this, and there's that one red line that's off to the side, and we're like, ha-ha, those are the people that find it very hard. When someone decides just to go off on their own and do whatever they want, it's frustrating <laughs> to the other players. 
So what we, we looked at then is addressing it with other forms of communication. So that's when it was more of a, less of a gameplay, but more of a UI question in terms of like, how do we communicate the waypoints in the game and how do we make it comfortable such that we allow players to explore this space and not like drive them specifically and let them have the freedom, but also give them the opportunity to know where places were. So this was one example of how we were able to encourage the gameplay to come together with the UI in order to understand better the experience of exploration. So sometimes you have to rely on how the subjective data is telling you to look at the data to find out better how those come together. Another area was um, looking at how uh, you can use visualizations to determine some of the parts in the game that players find difficult or may require communication across best practices. One of the examples is death from behind, so we use vector math to find out if the combatant was looking at the player and the player was facing directly away from them. And we could map this to the death locations of the player to understand what was happening. We also then used the videos that we had to look at those moments and kind of understand what was happening with the players. Um, the example here is that some of the combatants, in this case, the Shanks, were causing issues because even though they were meant to be kind of weak combatants that were just more annoying than anything, the problem that we had was that they were killing a lot of players, which shouldn't have been the case. So we looked at back at the information to see what was happening, and it ended up being a combination of where they were placed to spawn as well as, a, as, well as how their AI told them to path. So a lot of times they spawned behind the player and then they pathed and flanked right behind them. So they were always over the shoulder of the player and the player had no idea what was going on because they were fighting in front of them. So they were ended up getting really frustrated with these combatants because they're like, I'm getting killed by these things and I don't even see them. So that led us to communicate to both the AI team as well as the, um, the design team that they needed to place the, these these combatants in particular, in front of the player when they spawned in, so they could at least, if they flanked, see their pathing and, and react to them instead of getting killed from behind. So we are able to use this kind of visualization to understand better how situations come up with, player, with combatant behavior that is unexpected. We also had an example happen during our beta in terms of deaths from behind. Um, we had a, in our play test, the deaths from behind were pretty low. But when we got our beta results back, they were much higher. They were probably like 50-50. And we were like, what is going on? And the audio team had some suggestions. We never followed up on testing. I don't have any data to back this up. But they were mentioning that a lot of times the, the players would get cues that combatants were behind them. But in the case of a beta, a lot of people were playing on their TVs and didn't have the headsets on that we had them play with in the lab to have that audio cueing. So there's potential in understanding that sometimes you don't always find out what the results are until you put it out into the wild. And sometimes you play tests have play test labs aren't representative necessarily of the environment that the players will be in. So um, basically what we learned from the shanks and also other combatants is sometimes you have to use visualizations and videos in order to determine how to uh, best practices for the designers. Another formula that we used in terms of visualizations was the distance formula, basic distance. Um, to use kill death distance to inform design. So this actually helped us to inform multiple disciplines, design combatants, and environment in terms of possible places that were problems. So here, if you see the dark green, the, the players are, or the combatants are getting killed at an extreme dis distance. This is bad for the players because this means that they probably found a, a way to kill off the combatants, like snipe them from afar, which means that they're not interacting with any of the combatants in the space that they were intended to, which doesn't make a great gameplay experience. Or it means that if this was the player's death distance, it means that players are getting killed by combatants that snipe them off, which is super frustrating if you come across an area where you don't even see the combatant or interact with them and they're killing you. So this was a great way for us to identify places either in the environment or where the combatants were placed or how far the combatants could identify a player and shoot them to balance things out. So we informed design in terms of where their players, uh, their combatant squads were placed. We informed the environments in terms of if there were places that were problems that we would want to communicate out in terms of like, this is a potential cheese spot and we should fix it before it goes live. 
And also in terms of the combatant team, in terms of like, all right, players aren't seeing these combatants react, how can we make it better? Because for the most part, designers have a good idea about in each of their missions where they want the combat distance to be. And if those numbers aren't working out for them, that's a good indication that they need to address some balance issues. So this is an example of how you can have one view that you can pull data in after a study and inform multiple disciplines of the different changes that may, they may want to make. Patrols was something that we had a difficult time testing in lab. Um, they were, patrols, if you haven't played the game, are kind of a, not, a downtime activity and not necessarily uh, something that players need to do, but it's a really great way for players to gain experience, wait for friends between missions or things like that. And so in studies, a lot of players didn't give them great feedback, mostly because when a participant comes in for a study, their goal is to get through the content as fast as possible and as much as possible. And the last thing they want to do is just hang out somewhere for a while and shoot some enemies. So we weren't really getting accurate feedback with how they were designed and how players were using them. The best data for this actually came from our beta, which in which even though it was a limited content release, we were able to get information as to how players would actually use it. So while in our studies people barely used patrols, they mostly just went through the content, we found out that players averaged the longest in patrols for playtime compared to the other activities, which showed us that there was potential within these spaces and that they were a value to the gameplay. And we were able to inform the designers of such. Um, also, we found out that in the beta, players listed that they were at least somewhat interested, the majority of players listed that they were at least somewhat interested in playing more of these activities. So the thing that we uh, focus on is sometimes you have to trust design instinct and then there are other ways that you need to test this that may not be in the lab and to explore those possibilities. So one of the things over time is how to, how to choose participants and what kind of the advantages and disadvantages are. So with internal, uh, you've got the advantage that they're easy to access. All the players, uh, all the participants are next to you. You can just go up and ask them a question. They also tend to be brutally honest about what they've got to say to you. Um, and they also have more context of what's going on and what decisions you're making so they can kind of give an informed uh, advice. Along with that though also comes their own biases and their own agenda. Everyone comes from a different discipline and focuses on different parts of the game. So you kind of have to understand that some of the feedback you're getting, you're mostly getting kind of a high level like does this work and not something that actually may be true with real players. And from, um, from testing with a lot of the web and mobile stuff, we had such a fast iteration time and such a small content that we did a lot of um, what I dubbed the kitchen cookie tests which is where um, I didn't want to bring people in from the outside for 15 minutes, so instead I would um, sit in the kitchen for about coffee time every afternoon and have a plate of cookies and have a sign that said 15 minutes for a cookie. And for the most part, I would fill those very quickly. Like within an hour or two, I would have the results necessary to give the usability uh, results back to the, the web and mobile team that they could make changes and we could go further. And then once we got further with that design, we could bring external people in, but this was a great way for us to get some really quick feedback and convince people to get some, and the, the internal participants really enjoy giving feedback and being able to see some things develop that they might not normally get to play or have access to. Also for external though, there's huge benefits in the fact that you have a new set of eyes, there's people that haven't seen things that you're still trying to, um, that they're seeing it for the first time and figuring out any problems. You can also filter for your demographics demographics and preferences. So if you're trying to get a group of players that normally wouldn't play your game, you can find that with your participants. Um, whereas at least probably in your studio, most people there probably play games, so you don't get as wide of a breadth of games players. They're also generally honest with you because they really want to give you valuable feedback so they can come back for the most part. Um, the disadvantages is that sometimes when they first come in, you have to make it clear that you want to hear the brutally honest feedback that they've got, because a lot of them will only tell you what you want to hear, like, this is great, and you're like, no, tell me what sucks. Like, you really have to make it clear to them that you want both, and that you just don't want, that you're not involved with the design, and the easiest way I found with that is to be like, I'm not a designer here, like, tell me what you brutally think, because, like, they'll never hear what you have, to, like, I'll make sure to let them know through me, so you don't have to worry about, you know, hurting their feelings or something. I don't, I, I'm fine with that. 
The other problem is that a lot of them, without defining it, is that they want to be a tester. They come in, they're like, I found this bug. And you're like, that's great. I'm not really interested in the bugs that you're finding. We know we have a lot. We know we have some. I mean, that's, it's in development. It's going to take time. So defining to them what exactly feedback you want in a survey is um, super important. They also power through the content. I mentioned that earlier. Like they will, you can't really use the times accurately because a lot of them will just try and get through as much as possible um, and maybe be better or not take as much time to explore than they normally would. Um, and the problem, uh, not really a problem, but a bias that we always had to take into account is that the fan, they're already fans to some extent. We have our own database of participants that we draw from, and they go to our website in order to sign up for it. So we understood that we already had this bias when looking at the results that they were already fans of, at least of Bungie games, maybe not of the particular game that we're testing, because some of them didn't even know what game we were making. But we did test this across random people that we brought in one time, and we found that though, though it is a slightly higher, it's fairly accurate in terms of the results, in terms of the feedback we're receiving that this is what the player base would think about. We just always have to understand that it's probably going to be a little higher. So the, the biggest thing is identify what your audience is and then develop the study to fit that. So if you're looking for players that play FPSs, that's great. But if you're looking for players that maybe play outside of your range most of the time, like our RPG players, it's interesting to be able to um, look at what profile you're looking for and then define the study for that. So those are some of the lessons I learned while being a user researcher. And in all in one place if you want. So. Cool. Questions? Hey, um, I had a quick question about your relationship with the design team. Yeah. It sounds from presentation like you're pretty well embedded with that situation, so you're working with them on day to day, or is it every week? Is Kind of what we do is a lot, we're compartmentalized in some ways depending on the project, and it's more like, do this test, present the results a week later maybe. So what is your relationship like? So it kind of depended upon the team which worked better. So for um, early on, some of the teams I was, like the web and mobile team, I was actually embedded with them, which was great, because with how fast they were moving, it was great to just overhear things and be like, hey, wait, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but for most of the teams, we couldn't sit with everyone. So a lot of it is, um, I set up weekly meetings with each of the designers at one point for 15 minutes, and I'd be like, I'm gonna meet you at, my, at your desk. So that way they didn't have to worry about it at all. And I would just stop by and be like, all right, here's the study results from last week. And if I didn't have anything, I'd be like, what changes have you made? And how can I help test that when we actually have a play test? So it was kind of just setting up these one-on-one -on -one meetings and personalized reports and things like that that made that relationship work, especially for early on when there were so many people involved. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm interested in the different stages of the game you were testing, like I'm typically working more of a web UX role. Like, did you ever text? Is there such thing as game wireframes? Yes, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's uh, a lot of what I'm working with now is actually uh, if there's some things that take too long to like get into the game, we can use prototypes. So a lot of times we'll make make up click through prototypes that we can then evaluate at least to understand like does it help like. Does that make sense? So there's definitely an opportunity at certain points to include the, that sort of things. And especially for web and mobile, like, super easy. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, uh, going back towards the beginning of your talk when you talked about uh, seeing, perceiving the other characters, um, I'm having challenges with that of kind of I'm getting a lot of feedback of suggestions to see the other characters more easily, but that's mm -hmm. not necessarily what we want, so kind of brings up the, the question of not, you know, the design trade-offs of what's easy versus making it more challenged, so specifically for seeing the other characters, but that brings up the question also at a higher level, how do you kind of um, think about, what are your thoughts of thinking about um, challenge versus ease of use, for example? And that's combatants mostly, I assume, or other players? Um, like player enemies. versus player oh, or player. Oh, enemy okay, characters. yeah, so like combat situation, okay. Um, a lot of it came down to working with the art team and being like, how much did you want, intend this character to be identifiable? And especially like uh, damage spots, like for, I don't know, if you, if you play the, the Destiny, there's the Vex, which have the giant juice box in the middle that you shoot, like that was super important that we wanted players to aim at them, but not all characters have that. So it was kind of like, what, what's important to design about 
the combatants, what do you want them to focus on? Like, do you want them to identify a kill spot or do you want them to have to figure it out? And are they supposed to be stealthy or are they supposed to be like fighters? Like, what's their role in the environment and how do we make that clear to the player? And then what do you want them to be able to identify just by looking and which ones do you, like, for some of the stealth ones, they were too stealthy at some point, like their shadows were too stealthy. So at that point, like, how do you change that? And it's mostly putting it in the world and seeing how they interact with it and if players are still having difficulties with it. But also just asking them, like, did you notice this? And if they say no, then you know, like, it's not coming across right. So it's kind of a combination of looking at the data and getting some feedback on it. Yeah. Cool, awesome, thanks.